Adelaide. This is Strong Australia with David Spears. Good evening and welcome to the program. We're coming to you live this evening from the West Torrens Football Club in Adelaide. And we are just a couple of days away from the South Australian election, but tonight we're not going to hear from the politicians. Tonight we're going to hear from some business leaders. We've also got a crowd here, as you can see. Some of the locals have been enjoying their dinner here at the footy club. who will be watching along as well. Tonight, we are going to be talking about jobs. We are going to be talking about power prices. We are going to be talking about population and immigration. A lot of these issues dominating our national debate. But as I say, we're not looking at things from a political perspective this evening. Something a bit different. We are going to be hearing from business figures. This is part, the first, in fact, of a series we're doing, Strong Australia, with the Business Council of Australia. And before we get to anything else, let's introduce who we have with us here tonight, uh, starting with uh, Mike Hurst, the Managing Director and CEO of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, Gabby Costigan, the CEO of BAE Systems in Australia, uh, Alastair Haig, the Managing Director of Haig's Chocolates, a very well-known family business uh, that's uh, based here in South Australia, and Jennifer Westacott, of course, the Chief Executive Officer of the Business Council of Australia. A very good evening to all of you. Thank you for being here. What we might start by doing is a quick whip around of a, a brief explanation of your business. Everyone's heard of Haig's Chocolates. Everyone loves Haig's Chocolates. But tell us a little bit about the business itself. Uh, started by my great-grandfather, 102 years ago and so we make high quality chocolates starting from the raw cocoa bean and we have shops here Melbourne, Sydney and Canberra and with Easter coming up we employ over 600 people. Well, this would be your busiest time. So how many it people is. all up in the company? Is it 600? Just a bit over 600 right. at the moment, yes. Alright, terrific. Yeah. Now uh, Mike, what about Bendigo and Adelaide Bank? Again, it's a well-known brand name. But just give us an insight into the business itself. How many are employed? Where are you? Sure. So uh, we're nationally operating over 500 branches, 7,500 staff, $70 billion balance sheet. So we're the fifth largest retail bank in Australia, um, 160 years old this year. And probably best known for our community bank model where we partner with around 300 communities to deliver uh, banking services in and 90 of those communities where we're the only bank. Now, Gabby, BAE Systems, uh, a defence contractor with a global footprint, but tell us here in Australia, what does BAE Systems mean? Yeah, sure. BAE Systems has been in Australia for 65 years. Um, we operate across 25 sites. Um, we're one of the largest defence industry businesses in Australia, um, 3,500 employees. Um, and here in South Australia, which is where our headquarters is, we have about 1,000 employees. All right, now we've actually got a piece uh, that we've done earlier uh, on BAE Systems, it is uh, a big employer, as you mentioned, here in South Australia. When we hear about defence industries, uh, this is you know this is what we're talking about, and this gives you a bit of an, an idea of what you're doing, in particular the um, over the horizon radar project that we're going to talk a bit about as well. Take a look. We have a broad range of technologies we provide and partner with defence to develop stemming from hypersonics technologies through to high frequency radar systems and also uh, electronic warfare. When you hear politicians talk about jobs of the future and high tech manufacturing, this is where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> BAE Systems is a major player in the defence industry in Australia. Michael Partridge is the program manager for technology development. We have a number of export opportunities in front of us at the moment that stems back to what is ultimately the most successful Australian export in defence, which was the Nolka active missile decoy. And I think from that, we have an outstanding platform um, of export going into the future. Defence is a growth industry for Australia. There's a real commitment from government to see it progress year on year. You get to work on some of the most exciting technology and systems, and you're also working to support our armed forces. With nearly 3,500 employees across Australia, 1,000 here in South Australia, recruiting the brightest science and engineering minds is crucial to the company's survival. So is what they're being taught at university. The future of our workforce is absolutely dependent on our graduates and our apprentices. We see them as a vital component to continually refreshing our workforce. And with them, they bring um, additions and adaptations in terms of technology that they're learning to embrace through universities. They can bring that into the work and integrate that with our existing workforce and you get a perfect blend. But are we producing enough high quality graduates in the so-called STEM fields, science, technology, engineering and maths, to meet the demands of a business like this? 
STEM is absolutely critical to our workforce. It currently makes up about 60% and that will continue well into the future. The continued need to engage schools, engage universities to produce the level and volume and capability and quality of STEM students is absolutely critical. There's definitely room for improvement in the STEM fields. And that improvement has to start at an early age. To encourage, I guess, more people to come through the STEM program as graduates, I think it really does need to start at younger ages. Um, through the high, primary school, even as early as that, going through to high school, just need to show that, you know, it's a really versatile area and you can apply it to many different industries. It doesn't have to just be defence. I guess there's lots of transferable skills as well, which is really important. The Gingerly Operational Radar Network, or as we call it, JORN, is an over-the-horizon radar system and it provides wide area surveillance it covers the whole of the western and northern coastlines of Australia. Australia is a world leader with over-the-horizon radar technology and the government has just committed more than $1 billion to ensure we remain so. The Phase 6 upgrade will allow the detection of more targets and smaller targets. John gives us the opportunity through this Phase 6 program to create 400 jobs and they're highly skilled engineering and technician jobs. Through that we recruit 60 graduates and those graduates will really get the chance to work hands-on on leading edge state-of-the-art electronics technology and developing new software. For BAE Systems, the link between universities, industry and government is critical to ensure Australia is at the cutting edge with the defence technology it chooses to invest in. No point spending billions of dollars on something that's going to be second best. For BA Systems to deliver that technology to the Australian Defence Force, it's pivotal that we actually invest in our manufacturing technologies to allow us to remain at the forefront in that area. We need to get a really good understanding across industry and government on what are the areas that we believe we can compete on a global scale and then work with our education institutes to ensure we're putting in place the targeted investments to develop a depth of capability that will truly drive that innovation. So that's BAE Systems, gives us a bit of an insight into what you guys do. And the, the project that really jumps out is this John Jindalee Over the Horizon Radar. Some people probably heard of this, a lot of people probably haven't. Why should we know about this? Why is this something that Australia is good at? This is John is a great story of Australian collaboration. Um, so this technology is world leading technology and um, Australia, well, John has been around for over 30 years. And See, it's I, didn't, I didn't appreciate that, but it's been around 30 years, but we keep getting different uh, upgrades and phases of it. And there was, there was one just announced uh, last, week? last week, the government's um, uh, putting in, what is it, a billion, just over a billion dollars into this next phase. But it's, I mean, I don't know how much you can talk about it, but it, it, it allows defence uh, to be able to see a long way and see very small targets a long way up. Yeah, so it provides a, a vital role for Australia, the Australian Defence Force's security of our nation in that it, you know, it um, enables us or enables the Defence Force um, to enhance their ability to, to protect our air and maritime um, yeah. space, uh, border protection um, as well. Uh, but when I said it was a great story of collaboration, so this is decades worth of um, technology development with um, defence industry, the Defence Science and Technology Group and the Australian Defence Force. Mm. And BAE Systems, very proudly, we uh, were awarded last week the Phase 6 upgrade, uh, which for South Australia means, um, as you heard on the video, uh, several hundred jobs and also across our, border, uh, our broader supply chain, uh, probably another 120 jobs. And is this a technology we can export? Export? I mean, are we allowed to sell this to others or, or not? Well, you might have to ask the government okay. that. <laughs> That's probably not in your realm. Uh, the I, well, this gets into the broader question, not the export part, but about you know the billions that are being spent on defence. Now, we hear this from the government, don't we? They're spending, what is it, nearly $200 billion over the next 10 years on defence projects. There's the submarines going on. There's all the smaller projects like this one and, and, and another that was uh, announced this week as well that that didn't go to you guys, but this is the new armoured vehicle uh, that's going to be um, built out of Queensland. Um, a lot of people think, you know, this is propping up uh, an industry that's basically pork barrelling South Australia and so on. I'm sure you have a very different view on this though. Why is this government investment in defence industry a good thing? Well, 
This is a very unique time, I think, for the Australian Defence Force because they're recapitalising um, their capability um, and that's, that's why the government has committed to the Australian Defence Force and to the public that we're going to invest this huge amount of money over the next decade. Because we've got greater threats we're facing. We have. The threat environment is constantly changing so we need to, and companies like BAE Systems Australia have to ensure that we are investing and developing technologies that are going to keep us ahead of those threats. Yeah. Now, Jennifer, the, the question then becomes, are we spending it in the best possible way to leverage that spending, that taxpayer spending, uh, into the flow-on business opportunities, uh, you know, beyond just the defence contractors like BAE, but to the other high-tech manufacturing mm. that can flow from that. Are we getting it right? Well, it looks like we've started it right. I think the challenge is, do you start to create across Australia some centres of excellence. I mean, here in, in South Australia, you know, we should be making this a centre of excellence, not just in Australia, but across the world. Then we've got to make sure that the investment's right for BAE, the investment's right for other uh, international companies, the investment environment's right for smaller businesses that flow off there. And, and, and most importantly, that we've got the right skills and the right capabilities and, and that we're creating, if you like, a system in South Australia that, that is world leading in defence capability. If we try and spread this out all over the country, that's always the temptation. Well, see, I was going to ask you about this because yeah. you've spoken about this for, for years, really, that we need centres of excellence now, you know, whether it's uh, in, the, in the finance sector in yeah. Sydney, whether it's uh, defence here in South Australia, but we do still seem to spread the work yeah. around. Now, is that for political reasons? Um, what should we be doing? Well, I think we should kind of think about some centres of excellence. We're not a big country. I mean, you know, we're 24 million people across a massive landmass. We actually don't have the population to have centres of excellence everywhere. We're not like the United States. But even the United States, you think of Silicon Valley, centre of excellence, which actually came out of NASA and came out of the defence industry and built that capability around Stanford and various other bits that were already there. So we should play to what we're good at. We should do what we play to our strengths, grow new businesses, but if we try and spread that out uh, for political reasons or, you know, economists, great friends of mine are in the Business Council, um, who will often say, let the market decide. But sometimes you do need to actually plan for that. So you can plan for the infrastructure, plan for the skills, plan for the kind of regulatory system you need around that. I, I think most people watching this tonight, if you said we want to create across Australia 15 centres of excellence that are world leading, most people would nod their head mm. at the TV and say, yep, that makes a lot of sense to me. And this gets to an issue that's been a pretty interesting one in this election campaign in South Australia and that's about how to attract more uh, you know, professional, qualified, skilled people to come to South Australia and stay in South Australia to stop what's called the brain drain. Now there are various figures around this but I think the net uh, migration out of South Australia is around 7,000 a year at the moment and roughly half of them are young. Now um, Alice let me ask you about this. Is this a problem that you see in South Australia at the moment trying to keep particularly young people here? It it is to a degree. Uh, it's always nice if they come back. We hear anecdotally a lot do come back when they want to start raising a family and things. But it's great for young Adelaide people to travel, but what we've got to do is attract young people from other states to come to Adelaide to go to university and, and, and work. And, and that's the, the balance that we have to now, strike. Now, we all caught up earlier today with uh, some business people um, here uh, at the footy club. They come from across Adelaide. And this was one of the issues that did come up. It was you know, this, this issue about um, particularly school leavers going to university in Melbourne or Sydney rather than here. Now, Mike, why is that happening? Is it, I mean, there are clearly jobs here, but just not the right jobs, or does it get back to you know, whether if, if, if you do want to work in finance, you're going to go to interstate, you're not going to stay in Adelaide. Yeah, look, I think certainly Sydney and Melbourne, perhaps to a slightly lesser degree, are both becoming the financial hubs for Australia. And if you want to uh, work in those industries, I think you've got to be prepared to go to Melbourne and Sydney. So, Does that make it hard for you, for Bendigo and Adelaide Bank? Well, our head office is in Bendigo, so, you know, it, it is an issue for us and we've built a uh, um, business in Docklands as well where you have about five or six hundred people because some people don't want to live in regional centres but the you know the point that was made about people wanting to come back to Adelaide we've got 1200 people in a building here and we get really good people who when they get to the point where they want to have a family they've grown up in Adelaide they think it's a 
terrific place to grow up. They want to come back and it, it works really well for us. I mean, there's many reasons, right, why people are going to leave or, or, or come back or, or stay here. And obviously the big one is job opportunity in the field that they want to work in. Um, but there are other issues as well. And this came up during the, the lunch session we had here today as well. House prices uh, is another one uh, too. And trying to convince people that you can afford a pretty good lifestyle uh, here in Adelaide. And it's not just Adelaide. I mean, same story in a lot of regional centres around Australia. Absolutely. Don't think. Like, you know, the median house price here is four hundred and uh, plus thousand dollars. Um, median house price in Sydney is nearly a million dollars. You know, this is an opportunity, actually, that, that this is a place where people can actually come back, uh, bring their kids up, uh, live, you know, in a very, very affordable way, live a very good lifestyle. It's still a wonderful place here. And of course, then you've got to get the industry in so that the jobs can be created. Mm. But people, of course, people forget this, people create activity. People create economic activity. Uh, if you're a kind of self-funded retiree who's sitting on a one plus million dollar property in Sydney and you sell up and you come to Adelaide and you're buying $450,000 property, you're cashed up. Uh, you're going to be spending, you're going to be investing. So we, we shouldn't always forget that people are actually big economic drivers in and of themselves. Well, this gets to an issue. Yeah, sorry. So I was just going to say that there's a real chicken and egg yeah. around this population debate because, you know, you can't um, have the sort of growth that we want to have unless you're growing the population, you're growing the markets that you're in as well. So, you know, in which order does that come? Do you get the people first and then the economic activity builds around that or do you build the economic activity and the people come? And, and I think it's probably a mix of both. Well, I think my industry um, and South Australia is a really good example where the federal government through the Defence White Paper, the Defence Export Strategy, the National Shipbuilding Plan, um, you know, they have laid out their strategic objectives and intent for, you know, what is going to happen here in South Australia for the next 50 years. Um, for me, this is an incredibly exciting time uh, for South Australia. It's an incredibly exciting time for young people who have the opportunity now to see that they can have really exciting careers in the defence in industry working on cutting edge technology right here in South Australia. Well, I want to come back to the population debate, the immigration debate, because it's a, it's a red hot one uh, in, in the eastern part of the country right now and I'm keen to hear your perspectives on it. But just on this, um, you know, trying to attract the, the, the right skills for, for your business. We heard from some of your people in that uh, piece earlier. You need the, the STEM graduates, science, technology, engineering, maths. Is it difficult for you in South Australia to attract them here? Um, well, you heard on the video that 60% um, of my workforce um, have STEM skills. Uh, so, and we've been around for 65 years, so we've, we've done quite a job, I think, of retaining that workforce and um, putting in place the right programs within our business to be able to attract and retain um, those, those critical skills and, and build and are, those workforce. Are they homegrown in South Australia? Are they coming from other states? Are they coming from overseas? How often do you have to bring in? Yes, well, well my business is domestic across Australia, so we need STEM skills across Australia. Um, but when we, when we have opportunities like, um, you know, something that BAE Systems is bidding on at the moment, the Future Frigate Program, you know, that's going to create, if we're successful, more than 5,000 jobs, um, you know, across across that enterprise, and many of them will be here in South Australia. Um, that will be a highly skilled workforce of both engineers um, and apprentices, you know, welders, electricians, a whole range of things. So what we've had to do to ensure that we're ready when we are successful in that program, um, you know, is we start the mobilisation planning well before, uh, you know, to ensure that if we are down selected, can, that we're ready, you're to, ready go. to go. Yeah. So, in order for us to be ready, we have to work with the schools, the TAFEs, the universities, um, and we, you know, we sponsor a, a lot of different students. We sponsor PhD and students. And how, how do you find that? Because you know, I often am talking about this about the interaction between industry and universities and how we don't get it right and you know for years we've been talking about this but but how how are you getting it right well i think we're getting better at it um and not just bae systems australia but i think defense industry um you know as i said before we've got some amazing technologies here in australia that are developed by australians um and i think what the defense industry need to do is they need to get out of the shadows they they really need to talk about what amazing things we do and create in well, Australia. They, they, they don't exactly like to, you know, show off all the kit to everyone, do they, I suppose? But you're saying <laughs> they, they, they need to, what, talk up 
uh, what defence is doing in, in this sort of jobs of the future space that we often talk about, oh, the high-end manufacturing. You know, here in South Australia, BAE Systems has an advanced manufacturing facility where we build effectively um, the aft fuselage or the back end of the, the joint strike fighter. Yep. Um, you know, I mean, this is cutting-edge technology and we build the aft fuselage for every joint strike fighter and it is then exported from South Australia um, uh, to the United States. Some of them are also manufactured in the UK and some of our facilities in the UK. See, people don't know this. No, they don't. People and, don't know this. You know, this is great stuff and it's done by Australians. And, and, we, and you know, we, we're here in South Australia where the story, I think, for the last few years has Jennifer been very much about the Holden plant shutting down. I mean, I was out there yesterday at Elizabeth and it is quite stark to look at, mm. at this vacant, huge vacant lot now. Manufacturing's dead. But it's not, it's changing. It's changing. And the question we should ask is, you know, what, what part of that global supply chain that Gabby's talking about can we be the best at? And then we've got a plan for it. So to your point, a 50-year plan allows universities, industry to come together to start identifying the skills, allows you to start getting the land set aside, the infrastructure right. If, you don't, if you're trying to do this by catch-up, you're competing with Lockheed Martin and yeah. Boeing big international companies, if we're not ahead of that and saying we're going to make this a great success in Australia and we're going to plan for it, then we won't capitalise on that and we won't be able to transfer the skills in the car industry, some very, very skilled uh, engineers, design people in that car industry who could easily... Where, have, think, they gone, where have the car workers from Holden gone? Are they, are they being... I mean, are you, have you picked up many of them? Uh, <laughs> you mentioned earlier about a program we didn't win yesterday. Um, that didn't help. <laughs> right, OK. Because that was for an armoured vehicle. But I, I, get, I get your message now. They would have been helpful. But, I mean, whether it's um, uh, the, the, the over-the-horizon radar or indeed the future frigates, if you win that, I mean, uh, are there people who worked at Holden's who... Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, many of these skills are actually transferable. Yeah. Um, STEM skills, um, you know, whether you're a mathematician, an engineer, a scientist, um, you know, our business is very broad and we have a lot of domains that we operate across. So there are a lot of opportunities for us to look at adjacent markets to bring those skills in. And we yeah. try to do that. Yeah, Alistair, I'm keen to hear uh, on a different scale. Um, you're in manufacturing as well, I suppose, yes. uh, in, in the food manufacturing of <laughs> fine very high tech. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, what, how do you train your workforce? Uh, on the factory side, we basically have to do it internally. They get a bit of an external training, sort of in the food processing type area, but specifically for chocolate. Is that a TAFE? Do they do that? Or? Uh, it is, yes, yeah, a TAFE. Uh, how or do you find TAFE? Mangoes. Is TAFE producing the right people for, for a business like yours? Uh, they are for us, yes, yeah. That, uh, um, because you've got to be interested in food to get in food. I guess it's like any yep. um, industry or career if, if you're doing it. Cause yeah, but then to get that special Hague's touch, you've got to learn that on the job. Absolutely. So uh, it, it, depending on the job, it can take several years for them to, uh, to learn the right skills for us. And you were telling me earlier that some of the big you know, global chocolate brands uh, have now moved into far more automated systems, but you guys are sticking with the more traditional we're, method? We're still sticking with the artisan handmade uh, skills because uh, we make so many different products. Um, you know, every day we could make over 20 different products and, and that just doesn't lend itself to mechanisation or, mm. or automation. And do you have any trouble retaining the staff that this, once no, they're trained and skilled? No, and... not the factory. I mean, um, it's nice, nice place to work that uh, it's, it's air conditioned and Yep. Um, and there's chocolate everywhere. There's chocolate so. everywhere. <laughs> what's what's yeah, not if you so like chocolate. Right. Just before we leave this this point though, Mike, what about for your business? I mean, um, finding the right skilled, qualified staff um, to get into the branches where you need them in a lot of regional areas in particular, not just here in South Australia, but Victoria predominantly as well. Is that a difficulty? I think uh, the skills that uh, in banking are probably at some sort of an inflection point, really, because if you have a look at the uh, number of transactions going through branches today versus the number of transactions done on mobile phone, by far, I think over 92% of the transactions we do are done outside a branch. Is that right? 92%. Yes. So oh, yeah. a, a lot of um, what goes on in branches these days is advice, you know, customer service type stuff rather than just transactional stuff. And then if you have a think about some of the challenges that are coming for banking with fintechs entering the market, open data, um, digital 
then you know technology is going to be a big driver. So one of the things we do with La Trobe University is uh, help them with their IT course by taking six cadets on every year into our work program and they do their internship with us and many of them stay and it's a great way for us to be able to attract those skills but you know you've seen a couple of the major banks say that they'll be um, getting rid of a number of staff and then hiring engineers etc. We're at our board offsite uh, next week where we'll be talking about that and I think our response will be well let's train our own people they know uh, the customers, they know the culture of the organisation, they know how it operates, they're the ones who are best placed to be able to take us to that next level. Let's um, take a quick break uh, on that point because I do want to come to this uh, argument which flows from this into whether we have enough people. You know, In South Australia it is a different debate than the one you might get around Sydney and Melbourne. It goes to the population and immigration issues. So stay with us right after this. Welcome back. I want to turn to the population immigration debate. If we were in Sydney or Melbourne right now, the conversation is all about whether the cities are too full, right? The congestion, the difficulty in getting around, the fact that uh, you know we're seeing greater urban density in areas that people don't really want it, uh, that it's hard to come by a job because the immigrants are taking them, pushing up house prices, so on and so on. Here in South Australia, though, uh, Alistair, do you first on this? Uh, are there enough people, or do we need more? No, we need more. That uh, definitely, that uh, all the experts say that we're uh, we're underdone. But not only for the city of Adelaide, but in our regional areas as well. That uh, farmers just can't get enough workers when when it's harvest time, and uh, and then ports are crying out for people when when it's time to ship uh, uh, grain and um, and more increasingly with with iron ore and minerals and things. So so no, we we need more people. Yeah, and. Mike, in, in this context of South Australia and other regional uh, parts as well, is part of the reason that young folk often do want to leave and go to Sydney or Melbourne because their own population isn't high enough, there isn't enough activity? Yeah, look, I'm sure that's got a bit to do with it. Everybody wants to experience the bright lights and, you know, enjoy that side of it. But you know, Jennifer was talking before about we should have centres of excellence. Well, one of the things that we do have centres of excellence right across Australia is lifestyle. And, you know, it's a terrific lifestyle no matter where you want to live in Australia. And I think the um, growth of Sydney and Melbourne, you know, has been pretty significant over the last period. I certainly feel like when I go to Sydney and I lived there for 15 years, that it's a lot more crowded now than when I left in 2000. But that's an opportunity for us to build other cities. And, you know, that's how cities get built, right? There wasn't... Uh, a Sydney of significance 200 years ago and today it's a great city. And how important is the ability to bring in skilled migrants uh, for jobs that you need in your business? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's certainly important. Um, it can be a little challenging in the defence industry because of the security classifications right. around some of the work that we do. Um, but, you know, my business is a global business as yeah. well, so one of the great things about um, what BA Systems Australia can do is we can tap into our global business, um, you know, where we can give opportunities to my employees here to go and experience, um, you know, living abroad, as, as can we do the same. And we can also share the technologies that are being developed within our, our company um, around the globe. So... Um, and is, is that easy, that labour mobility, the ability for your workers to go to the UK, come back, to go somewhere else, come back. Is it easy for them to do that? Uh, well, I mean, it's not without its challenges, that's for sure. But on the whole, it is pretty easy for a, for a business like ours where there are niche skills and technologies that we may need between our business. We might be working on a joint program, as an example, and, you know, there'll be government-to-government -government agreements and things that will support things like that. So. Yeah, sure, for the niche uh, areas, Jennifer, that's no doubt true. But I think it's, it's not so much the niche specialist, it's um, you know, other immigrants who are coming in and taking unskilled jobs. It really is getting up the nose of a lot of people in Sydney and Melbourne. Now, you are a supporter, though, of immigration, the, the rates that we've got, and indeed a higher population. 
Well, you know, certainly there's no case, in my view, to change the current migration intake. The, the, the things that we should be thinking about is, is that the right skill set? Are we getting enough of the really skilled people that are meeting the skill gaps? That's the question we should ask. And then to Mike's point, you know, are we, are we planning for this properly? What, where is our big decentralisation initiative? Where are our centres of excellence? Where is the kind of push to grow regional centres? Because we often have this discussion, don't we, about sure, uh, yeah. immigration numbers are great, but they're all going to Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah. How do we get them to South Australia? How do we get them to regional Victoria? Yeah. How do we get them to the and, Northern and Territory? And it's that combination of government investments and big infrastructure, so you've got Northern Queensland, that's, that's part of this Northern Australia initiative. You've got to get business and government working together. You've got to actually plan for this. But you've also got to kind of deal with some of the problems that are in Sydney and Melbourne. I mean, the problems of Sydney in terms of congestion and the sorts of things that people are feeling now are problems of governments not planning properly and not investing in infrastructure decades ago. Now, the government in New South Wales is doing a magnificent job catching up, but catching up we are. So people feel the pressure of population growth. We haven't released enough land for housing. Uh, we haven't got the planning processes right. They feel the pinch. But I'm not sure the answer is actually reducing the migration intake, which would have a terrible impact across regional Australia. What we should do is go back to old-fashioned, good de de decentralisation, good planning between government and private industry and this is why I think these sort of this idea of centres of excellence has really got some teeth to it because well, yeah, it can't just be left to chance. That, that's part of it. I mean, what would you say, Mike, to, you know, your, your bank operates in a lot of regional communities. How do you attract migrants in particular to go and live there? Well, I think it's about lifestyle, it's about job opportunity. So, you know, we have, uh, this year we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the first community bank, which was a venture between ourselves and the communities of Rapanyup and Minyup. And they've got a you know, really strong farming industry through there, and they're attracting people with skills, vets and other things from South America and other places with the offer of the lifestyle they can lead and a good job. So. You know, I think there's plenty of opportunity for us to plan that well and, and you know we talk about maybe there's issues with migration but if you think about Australia through history there's been waves of migration coming over time and it's all ended really well. We've got a really diverse culture, we've got fantastic food because of all the migration and thing that's gone that, that has gone on. So I wonder whether or not there isn't something else at work at this point in time as well and that is People see that migration coming in. I, I hear what you say about them taking the unskilled job, but often they're the jobs that Australians don't want to do. And are we um, thinking about the future and talking to people about what the future is for them? They hear about AI, they hear about robotics, they wonder about what's my place in the future, and then they see this migration and they kind of put it all together. What we really need is a, a discussion about planning, a discussion about the future of work, and, and, this, fit in. Yeah, and this gets to something, Jennifer, you've touched on earlier as well, and that is, you know, the fear that people have around, you know, automation, robots are going to take my job, uh, this is the way of the future, you know, would I go to South Australia? Well, it's, you know, pretty busted now, the, the car plant's gone and so on. It's changing the nature of the conversation from fear to hope. To Absolutely, the... and, and I think it is a hope story. You look at the sort of things that BAE is doing, you sort of look at the sort of stable business that Alastair runs, you, you look at the opportunities in South Australia, tourism, still a huge resources base here, mining, uh, you know, still a massive kind of wine industry. This is still a very strong base to, to actually build off, uh, but you've got to get the skills right and you've got to get the kind of planning right and you've got to get the investment. If you can't get an investment into Australia, of course, you're not going to get investment into South Australia. I think the crucial thing with the community is to stop talking about stuff that, that is meaningless to people. So people talk about AI and robots taking over the world. If you talk to any of the experts, they'll say that is simply not going to happen. No. So that, that it will be it's people. Not. I can relax. People, people and machines <laughs> will be working together. Well, like, we, and, can, and, we can and, test and this do. theory here. I yeah. mean, Alice, you know, you could have machines doing presumably a lot of what your people are doing. Oh, we, we have experimented, but no, it doesn't work. So. Right, it doesn't taste as good. <laughs> we need the, the human element. You do? So you don't, see, a... you don't see a point at which, you know, because of economies well, of scale, you'll have to go to not, more automation? Not, not to a big degree. I mean, our new um, uh, chocolate production plant, which we're launching next week, um, that that is fairly automated. So the skill set for that is entirely different than elsewhere. So what's but, the difference? Because doesn't this 
doesn't this underline the point? So what, what will it mean? That well, that's our only sort of high volume area that we, we make sort of one batch for the day. So that lends itself to automation and, and mechanisation. But the rest, as I said before, when we're making 20 to 30 different products, we need that flexibility and that human capability of being able to, to change literally in 30 seconds, not have a three-hour machine downtime to, well, yeah, to set like up again. You, you were pointing out earlier that, what is it, 92% of our transactions uh, are now done... Outside of branch. Yeah, usually on the mobile phone yeah. rather than going into the branch. Is that another example here of well, well, don't people not, being replaced? I don't think you have to look too far back to see the last major change that came to the way that people work, and that's the computer. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Sydney in 1984, working at Westpac, uh, in the planning department, the uh, someone came out one day with something that looked like one of those Singer sewing machines, and it was yeah. actually a little, you know, portable laptop which weighed about 20 kilos. <laughs> Very portable. Yeah, gave me a, a book with a Lotus software in it, and I said, "What do I do with that?" And they said, "We don't know. You have to work it out." <laughs> yeah. And the amount of uh, change that's come about—you couldn't walk around in our office now without seeing anyone with a lap without a laptop. So, yeah. huge changes to the way that we've worked over that period of time. Yet, employment's grown through that period. Customer experience has grown through that period, and I think that's the outlook going forward. I think that the, the, the conversation is about jobs will change. But the way it's been presented is that jobs will be destroyed. Yeah, and, fear. and it's fear. Yeah. Yeah. And technology will change your job. But, but in so many cases, for the better, the sort of processing that your people would have been doing, yeah. now they're going to be doing high value added, customer service, direct service. Your people are doing very, very technical, right up the value chain, oh. more yeah. rewarding jobs. Yeah, uh, look, for me, people shouldn't fear technology. Um, you know, what, what it does for us. I mean, will it, will it reduce jobs? Yes, it will, but it will also create jobs. You know, so there are huge examples out there of where um, automation has been brought into the, the food manufacturing thing through um, the mining industry where they use autonomous vehicles. Um, but there's still a human in the loop there. You know, someone is controlling those vehicles in a control room somewhere. So they might not be driving the truck, but they're now controlling maybe four vehicles. Um, you know, but so in the we defence space, fear. it's interesting too, whether it's you know, unmanned drones. I mean, are we going to see tanks, fighter jets, all sorts of things flying without submarines, without people in them. Well, we already do. Mm. Yeah. So that is the way of the future. <laughs> um, well, in fact, I can give you a great example um, here in South Australia. Um, you know, uh, BAE Systems with um, Defence Science and Technology Group has done uh, several flight tests here of um, unmanned uh, vehicle technology. And, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting stuff. Um, you know, but from my perspective, for the defence industry, you know, what that does, this, as I said before, for my customer is the Australian Defence Force. So we've got to build technologies that help protect them so that they can protect us. Um, and the technologies that we want to create means that we want to be able to put, you know, the Australian men and women that work for our Defence Force out of harm's way. So if we can create technology that will provide that gap, like, a UAT, like an unarmed um, aerial vehicle, um, or a, um, you know, a, a, um, a surface vehicle yeah. where you can put that gap between harm's way and the soldier. Um, why wouldn't we want to do that? You know, I that, mean, that's, that's, a very, that's a very good idea. And, and look, I, th I think that gives you a pretty good insight into what we need to do with the community, and that is explain to them the benefits of really embracing new technology and how to do it. You know, if, if we can become... Um, world leading in a lot of these things, then we get to grow our markets and we get to make sure that business is actually getting bigger down here and that's when migration and population and all those sorts of things help create wealth. And that's what's happened in Australia over a long period of time. And right. it opens us up for great export opportunities exactly. as well. There you exactly. go. We've got to take a quick break after that. I do want to talk about um, issues that are of concern to business here and around the country. Power prices is one of them and no doubt company tax is another. Stay with us.
come to power prices, it's not surprisingly a, a big issue in this election campaign in South Australia. It's a big issue. It has been for, for some years now, wherever you go in Australia. But just given who we've got here tonight, Alistair, what, what has been your experience for your business with power prices? Well, our last power contract, um, we caught a 80% increase in the cost per kilowatt hour. 80% uh, increase. But it's not only that, it's the reliability. So whenever we're right. wiring a new building or area now, we're actually setting it up to actually have a generator so we can bring a generator in. So, so what you, you bring to, in your own generator, yeah, just to be sure. Yeah, yeah. Because what happens if, if there's a blackout? Well, it, we're not that critical, but I mean, if it's in a heat wave, uh, chocolates melt if the air conditions don't they run. They tend so. to do that. They tend to do that. So it is important. I it mean, is important. The reliability to, to and, degree, and the yes. price is yeah. something. Um, all right. And so what are you looking to government or indeed the power companies to do just to... Do you have any solutions well, to this no, or you just well, want them to no, fix it? If, if I had, I'd probably make a lot of money. Yeah. But uh, um, we've been told for ages that the reason why it's so expensive here in South Australia is because it's a gold-plated system. Well, the gold-plated system didn't work too well in yeah. uh, September last year, I think, or October, whenever it is, was. Is the power price issue a big deal for either of you in, in your businesses? Uh, certainly for, for us in South Australia, like Alistair, we saw a significant increase in um, the cost of power. More for so our than business. other states? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yes. Um, and, you know, and to me as a, um, a business leader, what that means is less cash. Yeah. You know, if I've got to pay more power bills, then I don't have enough money there to invest in new technology yeah. or, or, people. or people or to you know, improve um, wage growth in my yeah. own business. So. Um, you know, I certainly support Jennifer and, and BCA in uh, looking to the federal government for um, a national energy policy. Well, and, and you support Jennifer, the national energy guarantee Absolutely. that the yep. Turnbull government's talking about. But in this state election contest, uh, Jay Weatherall is promising a 75% renewable energy target. There are the batteries that have, that have been brought online now as well, here, world's biggest battery and so on. The Liberals want a new interconnector to New South Wales. Who's got the right approach from a business point of view? Well, I, you know, I'm not going to comment on the... Like, given it's two days of a, out of an election, I just make these points. This has been one of the great policy failures of Australia at the federal level, at the state level. And Australians have been part of an experiment, an experiment that's basically said, look, you know, we're going to um, assume that these things are going to cost less over time instead of actually working out what they cost now. And so we promised people all this renewable energy, uh, it crowded out or it pushed out baseload power, then we didn't have the reliability. Uh, you know, and and, and we, what we haven't said to the Australian people is what these things cost. So a 75% renewable energy target, what is it going to cost? Uh, it sounds fantastic, and I'm sure if you said to people, do you like renewable energy? Love it. Do you want to pay 80% more on your bills? No, not really. <laughs> so, you know, we've got to be really careful here. We have not explained to the Australian people that emissions reduction is cost money. I'm yeah. not saying it's but, the wrong thing to do, of course it's the right thing to do. But renewables with the support of batteries should over time provide the reliability. Well, let's and, see, and let's see, and that's the problem. We, we, we say over time, but of course it's what it costs today. And that's what's going to affect people's power bills today. And it will distort the National Energy Guarantee, which has worked off a national carbon target of 26 to 28%, and then retailers will have to buy to meet a reliability standard and an emissions reductions target. If states continue to do two things, one, put moratoriums on gas exploration, and two, set these targets that are way above the national target without any modelling to show what is the cost of that, uh, it's all very well to say in 25 years' time batteries will be affordable, the solar on your roof will be fantastic. People's power prices are high now. And people who just got their bill at winter, 700 bucks for a family that's got 150 bucks to spend on their groceries, they get a $700 yeah, dollar hurts, power bill, look, we heard they this, are in trouble. We heard this last night at the forum we did with the leaders too, from some of those uh, in and around um, the suburbs of Elizabeth, uh, really feeling the, the, the pain of those prices. A couple of other issues I want to finish on tax. I take it as a given you all support a company tax cut <laughs> that uh, the government's trying to get through. And look, um, I'm not sure the exact size of your business. Are you getting one already from what's passed through the parliament or are you waiting uh, for the, well, the next lot to it come depends. through? It um depends. One is above the one of our companies right, is okay. above the threshold, and one's below. And if, and if they're all grouped together, then none of them get the okay. concessions. So. But a lot of the debate is around: would it be passed on in wage rises? Right? If if this company tax cut happens, so would it? 
What, 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 would, what would you do if, if you get a company tax cut? Well, for my business, it's a little different because we'd have to talk to the Australian Defence Force um, around how, the, how we yeah. would structure something like that because any reduction in corporate income tax to us would have a flow-on effect to the government. So there's a bit of a challenge there for okay, us. Okay, so you're a bit of a unique position. We are, I but that, okay. if, we, if we look at other parts of our business, then we would still absolutely support a reduction in corporate income tax. Yeah, okay. And, and what about you, Mike? Oh, look, we run our business on the premise that we need to be balancing the interests of all stakeholders in everything we do. So I think if we had additional money and put aside um, what the investment opportunities might be at the time, because that will have a big piece in it, I would expect some of that would flow down to increased wages. So there, w there would be? Yeah, it wouldn't there. exclusively go there, but as one of the stakeholders in the business and with more ability to be able to do that, I'm sure some would flow there. And well, well, there's only a number of ways you can get a higher wage. You know, your company pays you more because they're more profitable, they're more successful, they've got more customers, they're earning more money. You get a different job because there's a new business created. You're unemployed, you get an, a, a job, uh, and, and you get more hours. And all of that, David, requires investment. And, and if you are not competitive, and your after-tax returns and your returns on investment are not good enough, then you will put that money somewhere else, you won't spend the money, or you'll go somewhere else. I mean, you know, you've operated in Asia, Gabby. I mean, the, you know, the, the tax rate on average is 21, 22 per cent. In the US, it's 21 now. I mean, when I was there a few weeks ago, uh, you and I talked about this when I was in Washington, you know, people were pouring investment in. So, you know, you know, this is the only way we're going to get wages to rise over time. We're nearly out of time, but I, I do just want to finish on the thing that Labor announced this week uh, to take away um, the, the, the cash refunds for frank dividends. Now, you've got to pay for company tax cuts, you've got to pay for a lot of things, right, from somewhere. This is where Labor says we should be able to pay for some tax relief, some other things as well. Um, Jennifer, just quickly, what, what do you think about this? Is there any concern in the business community about what it might mean in terms of investing in uh, taking, buying shares in companies. Well, well, Mike might have a view about how it'll affect capital markets. I, I just guess I ask this question. If you were trying to plan your retirement in this country, good luck, uh, because everyone keeps changing it. We keep making these ad hoc, tinkering adjustments. Uh, you know, we don't have a plan. We've not done a proper inquiry so to retirement. Leave it alone. Well, I mean, you know, here's my question. We don't want people to save and get a nest egg. We don't want them to have a little rental property they can rent. We don't want them to have shares in companies. We don't want companies to be profitable, employ more people. What kind of country do we want? Just quickly on that, Mike, what, did, what do you think of this idea? Uh, look, I think every time you tinker with these things, it makes it more difficult for capital formation. So, you know, people see the rules changing regularly. It's very hard to plan. If, if you uh, look at the low level of interest rates at the moment, you know, a lot of people have to go into capital growth things like stocks, etc. Then to suddenly find out that you know a significant part of your income is just going to disappear overnight, I think that's difficult. On that note, we are going to have to wrap it up. Uh, we have run out of time. Look, thank you all very much for the conversation. Uh, wonderful to hear some different perspectives on uh, these issues facing the nation, and hopefully everyone's got a bit uh, a bit out of your perspective.